That's very much what this week's about, amen, and seeing the world as the Lord does. Well, it is good to have uh, the Stensis with us, and uh, one thing I enjoy about the missions conference is that we hear a testimony from each of the wives, and so Miss Keela is going to come and give testimony. Her parents are members here at Southwest, Paul and Luana Bergner, right here to straight chamber with Paul and Miss Luana. Glad to have them here, of course, uh, tonight, and uh, so they've been very faithful serving in Uganda. And we've got a good balance here. We've got, uh, I think, six veteran missionaries and three that are on deputation. And so I'm thankful for that uh, ratio. And so let's hear from Miss Keela. And then our first preacher here in the conference is Brother Matt Census. So Brother Matt, right after the testimony, you can come right ahead. We're looking forward to hearing God's word. It's good to see everyone here. There's a lot of friends and family that are here, so it's like a reunion coming home, and that's a blessing. Uh, we've been looking forward to this conference for a long time. For those of you who don't know me, I was born into a, a Presbyterian family, and it, when I was seven years old, my father decided that things were changing in the Presbyterian church. We needed to go to a different church, and he was invited to an independent Baptist church was totally different than the Presbyterian Church, but he came and he listened to the gospel several times and he decided to make a change in his life and he walked down the aisle and I'm close to my dad so I followed him down the aisle and I answered some questions. I don't know what those questions were. I don't know what my answers were, but I know that they took me up and I was baptized. And shortly after that, we joined the church. I joined the Christian school. And in Romans chapter 12, Paul tells us not to conform to the world. And I would have to say that I didn't conform to the world, I conformed to the church. I learned what to say, what to do, how to dress, how to behave. I, learned, I memorized the verses. I could tell people how to be saved, but I was not saved in my own heart. And I was in high school when my Bible class teacher asked us to get the salvation testimony of each of the other class members. And... I told everyone what I just told you, and I claim that as my salvation testimony, but every time I told it, the Holy Spirit was, was talking to me and smiting my heart, and I knew that I was living a lie, but I wasn't going to tell everybody the truth until one Wednesday, I finally, I couldn't put up with it anymore. I couldn't fight the Holy Spirit, and I, I don't know what the preacher said. I was just waiting for the invitation, and I grabbed one of our deacon's wives, and I went down the aisle, and she, she turned to me and she said, you know the verses just as well as I do. You, you know what needs to be done. And we prayed together and I trusted Christ as my savior. From high school, I went into Oklahoma Baptist College and I surrendered my life to the Lord to serve him where he wanted. And I eventually surrendered to Africa. My, my father, he, he met me down at the front, and he said, now I'm not going to tell you that you can't surrender to Africa, but you do know that you're limiting your dating pool. <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord knew what he was doing, and the Lord brought me somebody that was going to Africa. And we, we met and married when I was in, in college, and we, we finished the college and went on the deputation trail. And I've had a lot of people since then asked me, okay, my daughter is surrendering to the mission field. How can she prepare? And there are so many things that I didn't know when I went on the mission field. But, you know, if you stay close to the Lord, the Lord prepares you for what you need to do. He doesn't call us to the field because we're equipped. He equips us as we are doing what he wants us to do. So just, I encourage you, if, you're, if you are thinking about surrendering to the mission field, if you are praying about it, if you feel like the Lord is burdening your heart, just stay close to the Lord. The Lord will tell you exactly what you need to do and what you need to, to do to prepare yourself. But he, he wants you to be willing. That's all he wants. And we, we praise the Lord that we feel like we have a front row seat to watch what the Lord is doing in, in Africa. And I thank you for having us come. And I look forward to um, hearing all of the other missionaries' reports and also reporting what the Lord is doing in Uganda. It is a blessing to be back with you. Uh, we were here five years ago and... Uh, just looking forward to when we knew that we were going to come uh, to be able to be here at the missions conference. We get excited because we've been here before and uh, it's such a blessing to, to 
the spirit here is, is amazing, and we appreciate it so much. If you take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 14, I feel like Brother Brewer should be the one starting this conference out. 44 years, that is faithfulness. That is amazing. People will look at us and say, well, you've been over there 25 years, but you know, there's a, a lot of people that have been faithful so that we could do that. Churches like this that have been faithful in sending out missionaries and supporting missionaries, we cannot do it without churches like this. And so I thank you for your faithfulness, for sticking by the stuff. When other churches are departing and going from the way, thank you for staying straight. Thank you for reaching the world from right here. I used to think that furloughs were something man-made and uh, I never liked him because I felt like I'm supposed to be in Uganda. That's where God has called me. But yet I come back here and I, I don't say it's a relaxing time because we travel from one place to the next and stay in a different bed, probably three or four different beds in a week and going from state to state. And, and I just wondered, I thought, really, is, is this really a part of what we're supposed to do? I, I'm supposed to be in Uganda. But I believe it's biblical. Amen. In Acts chapter 14, we see the end of Paul and Barnabas's missionary journey. They start in Acts chapter 13 as they're sent out from the church where they are serving, where they are busy. God calls them and sends them out. You get to the end of chapter 14 and they conclude their journey and they start to go back visiting the churches where they were, encouraging them, edifying them, exhorting them. Let's pick up their journey in verse 21. Acts chapter 14, verse 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. When they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. When they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Italia and thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. They went back to their home church, the church that sent them out. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. Here we have the first missionary furlough. They've come back and now they're reporting to the church about what God has done. What a better way to, to encourage those who sent them and even challenge more workers to be called to the field. This may be unusual, but I would like to take tonight's message and report what God has done there in Uganda and maybe challenge you to do something right here in Oklahoma City. Father, I pray that you bless the message tonight. I pray that you'd give me exactly what you want me to say. May you challenge our hearts that we can do more for the cause of Christ. Lord, there's so many that need to be taught. Are we teaching them? Bless this message, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Again, I want to say thank you for your faithful support now for 21 years. Uh, you've trusted us in sending us the money so that we could go there and do the work that God has called us. We do not take it for granted, and we are very thankful for that. We're also thankful for you taking the time to pray for us. Sometimes you think missionaries are just all about money. They just want money. Amen. <laughs> but you know, there are times that you can send us a half a million dollars, and that's not what we need. We need the prayers of God's people praying for us. Uh, I'm going to share with you a lot of highlights, but that's not all there is. There's a lot of difficulties. There's a lot of trials, failures. But your prayers and the prayers of other churches have kept us going, and we're so thankful for those prayers. Some people may not really know what a missionary does. They hear the term missionary, but they think, what is a missionary? Okay, they go to a field. Well, what do they do? Yeah. Some think they might start orphanages because there's a lot of orphans. 
uh, because there's a lot of diseases and, and the parents die, then they start orphanages to help people. Maybe they dig wells. Maybe they feed the poor or start technical schools to, to give people skills. And those are good things, and, and we do some of those things. But that's not what a missionary is. It's not what he does. His number one priority is preaching the gospel. That's the number one thing. He preaches the gospel. Those who get saved, he baptizes them. He disciples them, or as the theme here in the conference is, he teaches them. Amen. Amen. And then he gathers those converts together and results in a church being started. That's what Pastor mentioned. That is the Great Commission. That's what a missionary is supposed to do. Now, in Uganda, it's a, it's a little different because in Uganda, there are over 50 languages. Anybody know how many counties are in Oklahoma? Counties? 70? 77. Imagine every county in Oklahoma having a different language. How would you go soul winning? Which language track do you take when you go here? Or here? Or here? It's difficult. Uh, there's not five-minute conversions in Uganda. Maybe there's not five-minute conversions here. You see, Ugandans are very distrustful people. They've been lied to by so many dictators, so many corrupt politicians. They don't just trust anybody. You have to live the gospel before them. And when they can begin to trust you, then they'll listen to what you have to say. That takes time. It takes relationship building with people. Now, the gospel we preach does not change. Salvation by grace through faith. That's it. No works, no law. When we went to Uganda, it was like everybody was saved. Either they're a Muslim or they're a Christian. I don't know even why God called us to go to Uganda because everybody was a Christian. Well, okay, that was kind of a joke. Y'all didn't really get that. <laughs> Their understanding of Christianity is that if you've been baptized, you're a Christian. If you've been born in a so-called Christian family, you're a Christian. So the country is very open. But the problem with that is they think their Christianity is going to take them to heaven. And so when you witness to them, you have to get them lost before you can get them saved. Maybe we need to do that here in America too. People think they're okay. No, we're not. That's why we need Jesus Christ. Now in Uganda, we, we, we have to be creative in how we give the gospel out. Um, if you go door to door, uh, people will invite you in and they'll fix you a meal and they will not sit with you. So you might be in their house maybe an hour or so and they have fixed food for you, but they're going to go away and give you privacy and you sit there because you're the honored guest. So door knocking doesn't work quite in that way. So you have to be creative in how you do things. And so what we do, because in our services we preach mainly to our church people to build them up, we're not necessarily preaching salvation messages. And so we have conferences where we bring the lost people in specifically to preach the gospel to them. There's a lot of elderly people in Uganda. When you're in town, you get old, you go to the village to die. There's no work in town. You can't work, so you go back to your village, and that's where you die. Well, when they're with their family, the family's saying, hey, you're eating my food, but you're not digging in the plantation. When are you going to stop eating my food? So they have this helpless and worthless feeling. And so we said, hey, the Lord cares about these elderly people. So we're going to have an aged conference. So we've held aged conferences where we invite all the elderly people. We bring them in. We'll play some games with them. We'll have fun with them. We'll preach the gospel. And many of them will get saved. We'll give them a little bag of salt. And they are so thankful. They say, no church has ever done anything like this. We try to do that on a yearly basis. Before the next one comes, many of them have died. But thankfully, many of them have gotten saved at the AIDS conference. We have what we call Boda Bodas. Boda Bodas are motorcycles. And these motorcycles will take you about anywhere you want to go in Uganda. Literally. Uh, from one end to the other. I think that's why they call them Boda Boda because it's border to border. I think that's where the name came from. Now, these people will carry anything. And, and I'm serious when I say anything. I've seen chickens and goats. I've seen a cow on the back of a motorcycle. I've seen a three-piece sofa set on the back of a motorcycle. Coffins, you name it. They'll carry anything. And I've seen seven people on a motorcycle before, too. They're crazy. 
Most of them are young people. They don't have licenses, and it's just their way of making some money. A lot of them are involved in theft. That's kind of their getaway vehicle. And so they're not really looked, looked upon in society very well. And so we said, let's have a conference for these motorcycle guys. Great idea, huh? <laughs> now, our building that we have can hold about 200 people. So we said, there's a, like 1,000 boat riders in Kasese. And so we said, let's give out tickets for 200 people. We had 173 that came. Filled the building up. It was exciting, to say the least. Um, we played games with them. We had a race in the church building. We had motorcycles up on the platform. We had boxes that they had to see how many they could tie on and get on it at the same time and who could do it first. That was great. But then we had races. Now, we have a pretty wide aisle in our building. And so we had two motorcycles in the back and we had a race to the front. Now, I know you're imagining people are running up to the platform, crashing into the pulpit, but you don't understand how this race went. You see, when you, if you've ever ridden a motorcycle and you start to go, you pick your feet up. Well, here's the point of the race. Once you start, you cannot put your feet down. And the point is to be the last one to the front. So, in other words, you go as slow as you can. Nobody got hurt. Amen? We brought the traffic police in to hopefully give them some traffic safety. Uh, we played a game with traffic signs, and it was a flop. <laughs> they don't know traffic signs. They don't even have licenses. And so how are they going to know traffic signs? So we played games with them. We brought the traffic police in. We fed them. We gave them a reflector vest as a gift, and then we preached to them. We had several that got saved on that day and others later on after that time. We have a tremendous testimony in our town. They know our church cares about them. They say there is no other church that cares about the boat of people. Used to be, we had, when we first started the church, we were across the street from a Seventh-day Adventist university. And so that was the landmark. And I hated to do it, but everybody knew that Seventh-day Adventist university. And so we would always say, do you know where their church is? No. Do you know Bugema University? Yes. Oh, we're across the street from that. Now, there is no Bugema University, and everybody knows our church. It's the landmark. People know our church. Now, once you get them saved, you do the next step, and that's baptism. Sometimes it's in a river. Sometimes it's in a baptistry. Um, this is boring. <laughs> you know, the, the, the problems you have here is the water heated. For us, it's, is the water running too fast because it comes off of the mountain? And so sometimes when we baptize, we'll, pe we'll put people downstream in the river just in case the current catches them as you put them under. <laughs> Let me tell you, baptisms are exciting. Sometimes you have to walk two miles singing. That's oh, wonderful. It's great. You can imagine just walking around the church before a baptism. That'd be great. But you know, in Uganda... And even here in America, in any place, when you get saved, it's something that happens in your heart. Nobody sees it. So anybody can get saved, a Muslim, a Buddhist, anyone. And nobody knows necessarily. But when you make that public profession of faith, especially in Uganda, you're basically saying to your family, I'm turning my back on your religion. And that's a big step because that basically turns your back on the family. Many of them have been cut off. They've said, you're no longer a part of the family. But I'm so thankful that so many of them are willing to take that step of obedience, knowing their family is going to cut them off. We don't baptize by sprinkling or pouring. We immerse them. Because that is the only picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then we do the third part, which many churches are lacking. And that is discipleship. We teach them. We've developed an 18-lesson discipleship program one-on-one -on -one, where we get with them during the week and we teach them basic truths about the Word of God, about the church, about soul winning, about eternal security. Simple, basic truths. 18 lessons can last up to six months or even longer. When they finish discipleship one, they go to discipleship two. Discipleship two is where we teach them how to teach others. They're, they've been saved maybe a year. You say, what, you have a convert who's only been saved for a year teaching someone else? Sure. Absolutely. Amen. Unfortunately, there's people that have been saved 15, 20 years that have never taught one person. 
You see, when we give them, when we teach them discipleship, these are things they have never heard. They've grown up in, in religion, but they've never heard the word of God. So as we're going through these lessons, they're saying, Pastor, this is amazing. I've never heard these things before. This is incredible. It's just basic things, the foundations of, of the Word of God. And they say, we've never heard this before. They go through the lessons. Uh, they apply all the things. They become a church member. They're giving all these things. And then we get to them and say, okay, now you take these lessons and teach it. First one gets, or first one, uh, person gets saved. We give them the disciple and they go they come back after the first lesson and say, Pastor, you didn't teach me anything. Now, when I first heard that, I was kind of offended. I'm the one who spent months taking the time, hours, discipling them, teaching them. But here's what they meant. Because they had to teach someone else, they had to learn it even more than just me teaching it to them. And so we found that by them teaching it to someone else, that helped them learn it even more. Amen. Then they go to Discipleship 3, which is our Bible college. We have a four-year Bible college that meets on Monday and Tuesday night for three hours. And we continue that discipleship. We continue that teaching. Amen. That's what a missionary is supposed to do. Amen. Now, all the other things, they're a part of it. Those things come. Sure. But the most important thing is the Great Commission. In Casessa there, we started the church in 2015, and uh, we started around our dining room table. Then we moved out under the tree, but that worked until the rainy season came. And then we had to put some iron sheets on the back porch. We began meeting back there. God be continued to grow, and we had to find a place. So we rented a place in town. That was almost too small, even as we, as we got it. And so God continued to bless, and we had to get a piece of land. God provided us a piece of land right in the middle of town, right on the main road. What an answer to prayer that was. We started the Bible college. My wife started a kid's class uh, teaching the young people who now, 10 years later, some of them are now out of even the teen class teaching others. God provided the finances to build the church building, not all at once, but step by step. As we started, we paid the engineer so we could make sure it was done right, but all the labor was volunteer. Our people put their heart and their sweat and blood into building that church building, and so today it's their building. It's not the white man's building. It's their building. We started a police ministry. Every Monday, I'm able to go down to the police and preach to them. They have a, they call it a parade, but it's an assembly where they get together and I'm able to preach to them and pray with them. We've seen many of the officers get saved. Because of the police ministry and the good testimony God has given us there, God opened the jail ministry. Normally to get into the jail, you have to have a lot of paperwork. You've got to have approval letters and recommendation letters and all this other stuff. But when the chief of police says to you, would you like to go into the jail and preach? I don't know. Let me pray about that one. <laughs> Absolutely. And we've been able to go into the jail every week preaching the gospel. Nobody else goes into the jail. Because of the testimony we had there in the jail, we got into the prison. That's even hard. You have to go to the Capitol to get the headquarters to get all the paperwork and approval letters to get into the prison. God opened the door for us. We didn't have to do any of that. And so we're in the prison preaching every week, discipling. Long story, there's a guy in one of our villages who got saved, discipled, was in Bible college, was accused of committing a crime that he did not do. They even found the one who did it, but he's in prison. But he's discipling people. And he said, maybe that's why the Lord allowed this to happen to me so I can disciple people in prison. I can teach them, amen? One of the men in the Bible college wanted to start a church in his village of Kadashandad, and we said, all right, let's pray about it, let's go out. So we began going out on Tuesdays. We don't go out and start on Sundays. If you go out and start your church on Sunday, you start the war with all the other religions. Because here's a white man, a foreigner, who's coming to their village with a cult doctrine, trying to get them from their churches to go to his church. It's a losing battle from the beginning. So the Bible says, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So we start a Bible study on Tuesday or Wednesday. It's a religious country. Everybody wants to come to the Bible study. They come. People get saved. We start discipling them. We start teaching them. They go to their church. They come back and say, now, pastor, um, our religion teaches this, but you're teaching this. That's right. 
They keep coming. We keep discipling. We keep teaching them. And eventually they come as a group and say, Pastor, we have no place to go on Sunday. We need a church started. You know what that means? They stopped going to those churches because they realized they were lying to them. So now we start the church. Oh, yeah, we start the war. But now we have an army of people who know the word of God. And they can stand toe to toe with these religious leaders because all they know is their verses on giving and miracles and giving and giving. That's all they know. And so for our guys who know the scriptures, they're not intimidated by them. So the war starts, but now we have an army and the church can move on. That's how we started the church in Karasandara. And we're so thankful for the work that Brother Brian is doing. What a blessing. He's serving. There's a lot of difficulties. The devil is fighting. But he's staying faithful, and we're so thankful. Now, I could tell you about Cajendero. Cajendero was a fishing village. We started there with a man named David. Thought it was going to work out well, but then David turned out to be a con man. And our testimony was completely destroyed. So we had to pause. And sometimes that happens. But I'm still praying, Lord, one day we'll be able to go back to that village of Cajendero and get a church started. Lockdown affected us. In a, in, a, in a way different from America. But let me preface it by saying this. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. Okay, I just want you to think. If you could not go shopping, if all shopping centers were closed, or you could not get out of your house, how much food do you have in your pantry and refrigerator and freezer? How long could you last? A week? Two weeks? A month? If you're a hunter, maybe your freezer is full of meat. Well, Ugandas, most of them don't have a refrigerator or freezer or, or pantry. They go to the market about every day or every other day, and they buy for that day and maybe the next day. So when everything is shut down and closed and there's no job, nothing, what do they have? They starve or they steal. It's an amazing thing the Lord gave us, almost $40,000. to Brother Alex in his church also helped out greatly in that. We were able to put food packages together, rice and beans and flour and salt, and give them out to our people. Those that were lost, we gave uh, tracts, and people got saved because of COVID. We didn't have any streaming services because if they don't have money for food, how can they put money on their, or data on their phone to watch a video? Well, that meant, oh, and by the way, I couldn't drive. COVID spreads in a vehicle. Did you know that? Yeah. So I couldn't drive. I, they said no driving. So I had to walk or ride a bike. So every Sunday, I would ride a bike to our church members' houses, try to encourage them, give them some literature. My wife would print some stuff out, some material that they could use during the week. Uh, and, and so COVID for me was a very weight-reducing time. Uh, <laughs> But God bless, because we were discipling about 50 people every week, and so the church actually grew during that COVID time. The second lockdown in 2020, uh, we were ready this time. And so what we did is we divided the church up into nine different Bible study groups around town. We couldn't meet. The church building was closed, but we could have groups of five. Well, we had groups of 10 to 14. But it was okay, because the chief of police attended our Bible study. Amen. So I thought, we're okay if he's coming to ours. He would come, he would bring his wife and another officer. And so I said, we're good to go. So we had nine different groups around town where the, our people would meet. And so even though the building was closed, the church was moving on. And I'm so thankful for what God did there. After the lockdown, we started a ministry to the pygmies. Pygmies are what are considered an undesirable group of people. The government agency that oversees the pygmies is called the Uganda Wildlife Authority. They see them as animals. They come from the forest. They live like animals. They dress like animals. And so they take them to be animals. Through a series of events that God orchestrated, which was amazing, we were able to go to those pygmies and tell those people, you are not an animal. You are made in the image of God and God loves you and Jesus died for you and he'll save you today. And to be able to see some of them get saved and understand truly what the Word of God is saying. It's a very fluid ministry. There's a lot of things involved in that. But we're looking forward to when we go back to be able to get the first independent Baptist church started among the pygmies. I'm so excited about that. 
We started a ministry called Fishing Through Footballing. Ugandans love football. Not American football. Soccer. Amen? You missionary kids, amen? Yeah. They grow up playing soccer. And, and it's amazing. They, you find just a flat piece of ground and they're going to play football. It's, it's in their DNA, I think. They, they love it. And so because they love football so much, we said, how can we take what they love and, and use it to reach them with the gospel? So we said, let's, let's start a ministry where we will sponsor two teams, local teams. We'll sponsor them. And here's what we'll do. We'll say the winning team will give them a soccer ball. Now, to us, that's not a big deal. But remember, they don't have anything. Uh, there's no equipment that they have for playing football. They don't have cleats. They don't even have a ball. If they have one, it's going to be banana leaf fibers they've tied in a ball or maybe some plastic bags they've tied really tight, and that's their ball. So when we offer them a new soccer ball, oh, yeah, they're going to want that. So we have had many times where we played the matches, and we've learned you don't preach at the end. <laughs> you preach at halftime because everybody's still there. So we, we started that ministry where we would host two teams and then we would preach to them. And we had several people that have gotten saved from that. One man came and said, you know, I liked your preaching. Would you come to my school and preach for our graduation? I said, I'd love to. We went there, we preached. People really enjoyed it. People started getting saved. We went back for discipleship, started some Bible studies. And today there is the Independent Baptist Church in Chinayobio. Which is the church where Brother Xavier got saved, the man who's in prison today. Up in the mountains, we started ministry. God provided a vehicle for us to get up in those mountains, and those are not easy roads to get up to. They're very difficult. I took my van up there one time, and I said, never again, because I had to repair so many things. I think you said the same thing too, brother, didn't you, when you took yours up there? It'll tear them up. But God provided us a good vehicle that can withstand those mountains. And we've gone up there. You drive up about two hours. You park the vehicle. And then you walk about 30 minutes to the village. And these people will sit there and listen to you give them the gospel. What a blessing. And they have nothing. Now, again, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. God has blessed us. And that's okay. As long as we're using it to be a blessing. But these people have nothing. And they're willing to serve the Lord. I wish I could take you up to the village of Libueriachona. Let you see these people. Brother Jokum, who's leading the church there, he was one of those motorcycle riders, and his life was a wicked mess. He didn't even think God could save him because he'd done too many bad things. But he got saved, and his life changed. And every time, and, and there's a long story there, but every time we go up there to preach and teach and disciple, his wife says, thank you so much. My husband is a different man. And these are people you'll never know here on this earth. It's a village you... You probably can't even remember the name. It's on the side of the mountain up in Uganda. But there are believers up there that believe in the same God you do. They have accepted Jesus Christ just like you do. And one day they're going to be in heaven. And you've had a part in that. When you park in town, you have to pay. In Kasese Town, there are street parking collectors, tax collectors we call them. And so what they'll do is there's a company that oversees this. And when you, when you park on the road, they will put a ticket on your window or on your, under your windshield wiper. And then when you come back, you have to find that guy and pay for the parking. It's only like 15 cents. It's not a big deal. But if you don't pay, you will be put on the list of defaulters. And if you're on that list of defaulters and they find your vehicle, these, we call them the chain gang. They will come and they will bring this clamp with chains and angle iron and nails and put it around your tire and you're not going anywhere. Well, one day I was in town, soul winning. Amen. That's what missionaries do, right? Okay. And I come back out and guess what? My vehicle is locked up. Now, pastor, I'm preaching the gospel. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Why would God do that? Isn't God supposed to be concerned about my comfort? You've heard that before, haven't you? <laughs> he is not. And there was a reason why he did that. Well, in order to get that clamp off, you have to go to the office and pay the fine. So I walk to the office to pay the fine. Well, the owner of the company is there. And he looks at me and says, well, you're not from around here. What are you doing here? I said, well, I'm a pastor of a church here. We're preaching the gospel. He said, really, you're a pastor. Would you come down every Monday and Thursday morning and preach to my guys? 
Let me pray about it. <laughs> Absolutely, I would love to. So for months, I would go down and preach the gospel to those guys. And it seemed like these are just young guys. They don't care. They care about their phones, about girls, and about football. That's it. Well, one, sa- one day, three guys said, Pastor, would you come back and talk to us again on Saturday? So I went back to them, talked to them, and those three guys accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because of those three guys, two other guys got saved. Now, today, those five guys do not work for the street parking anymore. They're serving the Lord. They got saved, baptized. They've been discipled. They're in Bible college. Some of them go to the jail. Some of them are in translation ministry. Some of them are leading the youth. Just the street parking ministry. Something you would think, what is that? There's a lot of deaf in Uganda. My wife has learned Ugandan sign language, and so she's been able to help the deaf a lot. That's another group of people that are considered undesirable. You see, most deaf people, as they grow up, they they don't learn sign language, and so their signs are very rudimentary, and they're not pleasing to other people, if I can put it that way. They they make noises, and people don't like them, and so they take them to be retarded, and so they shun them. But all oh, their face lights up when they come to the gate and they ask for Mama Marcus. And she comes out, and I don't even know the sign language. Some of them have gotten saved. She's been able to teach some of the Ugandans how to sign for the deaf, and that ministry is still going on even today. Reaching those people that nobody else cares about. I mentioned that there's many languages in Uganda. Well, many of them don't have the scriptures in their language. Uh, We have so much to be thankful for. And we take it for granted. There are so many tribes in Uganda that do not have a copy of the word of God in their language. Now, we can criticize them all we want. But we have a lot. I'm thankful that we have a translating team that is translating the scriptures into the Lukonzo language. We have a John and Romans and we're working on the New Testament to be able to go into the mountains and give them a copy of the word of God in their language. Oh, I can't wait. I'm so excited about that. We can go in schools. Schools are wide open. You can go to 10 different schools every week and preach the gospel. It's wide open. In Uganda, if you want to get married... You have to pay a dowry. The guys have to pay a dowry. Um, And that dowry is in goats. The tribe of people that we work with are Bakonzo people, and you have to pay goats. Now, a goat in Uganda is worth one month's salary. Guys, if you want to get married, you got to pay 12 goats. And I'm not going to ask you how many of your wife is worth it. I will get in trouble. I'm not even going to go there. Now, you can imagine a country that is considered a third world country that they don't have money to spare. They're barely making it from day to day. And now they have to come up with a year's salary to give to the father-in-law to get married. Many of them then just say, forget it. And they begin living in fornication. It's rampant all over. Every church we've ever had to start, you have so many people, they're just in fornication. Well, here's the blessing. They get saved. The couples get saved. We begin to disciple them and they realize, hey, we're not doing right. We're living in sin. Pastor, what do we do? I say, well, first of all, you need to separate. Oh, but pastor, we want to get married. Yes, that's good. But you must separate. If you want God to bless you to get married, you must separate. God is not going to bless you if you continue to live in sin. Some of them do. Some of them say, oh, that's too much of a sacrifice. Others do it and say, we're going to do what's right. They come back and say, okay, pastor, we've separated. Now what do I do? I said, you need to go to the father-in-law. You need to talk to him. And you need to negotiate with him. (laughs) And see if maybe he'll reduce on the goats. Maybe he'll say eight goats or ten or six or whatever. But you can talk to him and maybe try to get him to come down. That was not mine originally. I just wanted to say that's a pretty bad joke. (laughs) (laughs) So some of them will come back and say, Pastor, I talked with my father-in-law. He wants six goats. I have three All right, let's pray for three more. Another guy, pastor, I'm supposed to give eight goats and I've got four. I need four more. All right, let's pray for four more goats. I'm not paying their dowries. I can't. If people found out that I'm paying their dowries, 
everybody would come to our church to get married. So they know I don't pay their dowries, okay? So what are we going to do? We have all these couples in the mountains, in the villages, in town. They've separated. They've done what's right. Now they don't have money. Amazing thing. God provided us the equivalent of 82 goats. So we had 15 weddings in seven months. <laughs> we weren't starting churches. We were starting wedding chapels. Yeah. <laughs> it was amazing. Here are these new converts can see how God can bless when they do what's right. As we teach them the word of God, that that is the authority, not culture. And when they follow what the word of God says, they see God bless. Now, while we're on furlough, we have three men who are leading our churches over there. We're so excited for them and the work they're doing. They're standing in the gap, and we're so thankful for them. Pastor Brian is leading the church there in Karsandara. We have about 30 men who are in Bible college right now who are continuing on, and the blessing of this is all the ministries that we're doing are being done by the Ugandans. They're doing it. They've stepped up, and we're so thankful because we have taught them. Now they're teaching others. When we go back to Uganda, Lord willing, we'll turn that church over in town to Brother Joshua so he can continue that work. That will give us the freedom to move around to these other new church plants, new preaching points. Some of the guys in Bible college are going to graduate this year. They want to start churches, and so that will give us the freedom to really work with them and help them so that they can continue to see other churches started. Some of them need help with land. Some of them need help with buildings. Uh, well, here's what we do. We say, look, if you can get the bricks... You can make the bricks. When you have enough bricks for your building, we'll come and help you with sand and cement. you got to have some part in it. It's not just a bunch of uh, money coming from America. You do your part, and we'll help you. Now, what we're doing is the most expensive part, and that's fine, but they've got to do their part. Now, you need a roof. You put the rafters on. We'll come and put the iron sheets on. We've got a lot of projects that we're going to do. A lot of these conferences that we, we like to hold. Ugandans love conferences. And as we have them, people come and we're able to preach the gospels. But those cost money. When you've got to feed people three meals a day, it costs a lot. You have 100 people come. Now, I know this does not, 100 people doesn't look big to you all. But to me, that's big. <laughs> and that costs money. And so... Pray that God would just continue to provide the funds so that we can do these printing tracks. We're able to do them over there now. We don't have to ship them. We have companies in town that can do it. Printing tracks and discipleship material so that we can what? Teach others. Now here's my challenge to you tonight. What we're doing in Uganda is not unique to Uganda. It should be done right here. You say, what is that? Churches, planting churches. Amen. Church is not a building. Now, I know we refer to this as a church building. We say we're going to church. But when you look in Scripture, church refers to people. Right. People start churches. Can I ask you if you are involved? Wow, it got quiet. Yeah. Are you involved in planting churches here in America? There's no foreign field with God. Why do we expect the missionaries to do it, but we're not doing it? Wow. Well, what do you have to do? Soul winning. Right. Your people you work with 40 hours a week, you see them all the time. Good. Your neighbors. Right. Well, my neighbors talk funny. Their, their culture is a little different. They, they're from another field or another country. Well, praise the Lord for that. Oh, well, you know, they, they might be a terrorist. <laughs> Anybody met a terrorist? Most Muslims are not terrorists. Right. Most Muslims hate terrorists. Right. They give them a bad name. Oh, but pastor, you don't understand. How, how do we expect them to change? Yeah. Yeah. If we don't tell them the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Those people are praying. They don't know the truth. They may be praying to Allah or they may be praying to Buddha or whoever. They don't know, but they're praying, God, show me the truth. But missionaries can't get into the country. And so God, who loves those people and who says, if you seek me, you will find me, 
God says, I'll bring him to America. Now, we're not going to get into politics, okay? But God says, I'll bring him to America and let him live right next to an independent Baptist church member. And what do we say? Oh, they're different. Are you involved in soul winning? You probably shop at the same store every week or every two weeks. Do those people know you're a Christian? You get them saved? There's a lot of ministries you can be involved in. Maybe you could pray, Lord, what ministry would, could I start? And maybe from that we might get three or four people that would begin serving the Lord and maybe be a missionary one day just from a small ministry. Then you get them into church so they can get baptized. And then there's that third part, discipleship, teaching them. How long have you been saved? How many people have you taught? You see, church is not a club where we just come and we sit and we enjoy and we sing and we hear the choir and it's so wonderful and and we go home and we come back and we sit and we listen. It's like a club. If I don't feel like going today, ah, they won't miss me. That's not what a church is. A church is supposed to be people who are serving the Lord. We, didn't, we weren't saved to sit. We we're saved to serve. It's not just the pastor's responsibility or the staff. It is every Christian's responsibility and especially church members. Why are you even a church member? So you can vote? What is your purpose in this church? Well, we send money to missionaries. We pray for missionaries. Great. But what are you doing? You know, we used to say everybody can give and everybody can pray and some can go. No. All can go. Well, Brother Stin says, you don't understand. I have a job. I work 40 hours a week. Amen. I can't work in Uganda. That's why we're dependent on churches like this to send support so that we can go there. You have a place where you work with people every day. What an incredible opportunity. Maybe we focus too much on door knocking. You see, when you go door knocking, and I'm not against door knocking, but you go door knocking, they don't know who you are. How is it that you win more people door knocking than you do at work? Because those people know who you really are, and they don't want any part of what you have. Are you involved? It's what missionaries do. It's what every Christian is supposed to do. It's no different. It's no different. God has called us to Uganda. God has called you here. Is this a church planning church? And I love the college, but forget the college. I'm talking about the church. Churches plant colleges. Colleges don't. I'm sorry. Churches plant churches. Colleges don't plant churches. This church should be planting churches. Are you involved in that? Soul winning, baptizing, discipling. It's what we do as missionaries. It's what we're supposed to do right here. That's true.